Extraordinary, The Power Series Book 3. Written by Star Z Davies. Narrated by Gillian R. Shelton. 4. Polly is gone before my trainer arrives to escort me ten levels down into the training facility. I'm uncertain if this is a reprieve or if I sincerely feel sorry that she isn't with us. The girl seemed apprehensive of me once she heard my name. Why? Nevermore Poe, my training officer, turns out to be a boy only marginally older than me. As we ride the freight elevator down, his beady, bird-like eyes observe me. Between his jet-black, slicked-back hair, the paleness of his face, and the manner with which he stares, he reminds me of a raven. He isn't somatic like me, one of the four branches of powers that enhances the body. The slim, frail shape of his frame makes that abundantly clear. It leaves me incredibly curious to learn what his power is. Polly said you were coming for both of us, I say, soliciting conversation. But she was already gone. She isn't in our unit, he says, and his voice slides over my skin like slime. I nod as if this explanation makes perfect sense. It's likely trainers only work with their own units. Does that make Nevermore my superior? Just considering him my commanding officer makes my stomach bubble in revulsion. I have no compelling reason to hold such an intense reaction toward him. I don't even know Nevermore. But again, my mind is pushing back against my emotions, rejecting any recollection of him while still seeking to warn me. You're uncomfortable with me, he says. Can he read my mind? I wonder. If he can, that would make Nevermore a telepath from the psionic branch of powers that enhances the powers of the mind. The rim of his mouth curves up into a smirk. Follow orders and you will have no reason to be uneasy around me. We walk out of the freight elevator into an immense chamber. The stink of stone slams against me like we are in a cavern deep underground, like a superhero's lair hidden away from the world. The rock walls, floor, and ceiling are smooth and roughly 30 feet high, allowing ample area for practicing jumps or climbs. The training facility may have been nothing more than solid stone deep beneath the facility itself, but with the expert abilities of naturalists, one of the four branches of powers that can manipulate natural matter, they had molded the stone out into this enormous chamber. Around the outlying rim of the training floor, which is as big as several football fields, if not wider, is a rubber running track. Other special forces officers like myself launch themselves over simulation platforms, scale a rock wall, practice firing at targets, or face off in roped sparring rings. A rope obstacle course with bridges and swinging ropes and climbing poles is currently unused, but I don't doubt these agents find a chance to practice on it. The sheer amount of training options seems unlimited. A weightlifting set in one part of the facility catches my attention. Hopefully, I will have time to challenge my limits with it. Three levels up, a series of metal bridges crisscross the field, and men and women in white lab coats mill around. There are only a few of them engrossed in whatever data their tablets are reporting, operating with evident purpose. Despite the massive area, only nine other agents are training. They work in groups of two that cluster close together. One pair runs past Nevermore and I after we stride over the track, but they hardly cast us a perfunctory glance. I could easily outrun both of them without batting an eye. Polly is working on her aim with a boy about her height. He guides her arm into position. Perhaps he is her trainer. Nevermore joins another boy my age beside one of the flat white simulation platforms. I immediately recognize his handsome, chiseled face as it cracks into a captivating smile when he looks at me. Happy to see you made it through to the other side, he says. Hound? I beam back despite myself. Hound? That isn't his actual name, but I can't seem to recall what it is. My emotions are at odds with each other once more. I'm both delighted to see Hound while also furious with him for reasons I can't determine. 
The other side of what, I wonder? You volunteered for an experiment that a lot of others did not complete, Nevermore says, and now I'm positive he can read my mind. When you enlisted in the DMA Special Forces, you agreed to an experimental injection that would enhance your strength. The injection doesn't work for everybody, and they eliminate those who fail from the program. You pass the first phase. I sweep my gaze over each of them. Hound is taller than I am and moderately well-built, but I doubt he is somatic, and I've already determined that Nevermore isn't. No, on both counts, Nevermore says. I wish he would quit reading my mind. As you've already surmised, I'm a psionic telepath. Naturalist hematology, Hound says, as if I will understand precisely what that means. I don't. He's a bloodhound, Nevermore explains, and can track anyone with a blood scent. Hound. Now that makes sense. So I was correct. It isn't his name, just like steel isn't mine. It's his call sign. You two know each other already, Nevermore says but periodically the injection can do strange things to the mind. Hound grins again in that charming manner that causes my stomach to flip. We went to high school together, and we were pretty close. I can fill you in later if you want. That must be why he seems so familiar, and he must have done something that made me mad as well, which would explain why I feel so furious with him. Nevermore casts a disapproving glare at Hound, but mentions nothing. Other units consist of four agents, I say. Who are we missing? Vortex. Hound rubs at his neck. She had some trouble after her last dose, so they have her in for further tests right now. She should return in a day or two. It's pretty unusual for anyone to be gone longer. Vortex. Another girl. What is her power? They both grin. She can show you herself, Hound says. But she is divinic. Divinics are the final of the four branches of powers, with supernatural powers such as reading auras or healing. I can't help but speculate what Vortex can manage. What dose? I ask as the news finally seems to stick. I don't recall receiving any doses. It's your enhancement dose, Nevermore explains, scowling. Part of phase two. You get one every night before bed. You take it before you go to sleep. It will help you rest as the enhancement does its thing. If you lose a dose, you will have to request a replacement using your tablet. Your request will be reviewed, but it's pretty unusual for them to provide a replacement. And without it, your enhancement could have negative effects on your body. The scientists don't actually know what it all could involve, but degenerative diseases are a real risk. Don't miss your dose, ever. Have I already missed a dose? A flash of panic grips me, and I have to assure myself that the scientists wouldn't let that happen. Maybe they administered it to me, and I just don't remember. What happens if I don't complete phase two? I ask. Nevermore shrugs. Most of us are still in phase two. He crosses toward a sparring ring and Hound follows without prompting, leaving me to trail along behind them as if the discussion is over. In the field, Nevermore begins as he assumes a position near the edge of the ring, we will encounter quite a bit of resistance. If we face down large groups or strong powers, we need to be ready to defend ourselves, and it requires more than just fists. Did he just sneer at me? He probably longed for somatic power before his telepathy emerged. We have to learn to act as a unit, which means we need to understand each other's strengths and weaknesses, he continues. To achieve that, we'll fight using only our powers. Hound, show her how it's done. All the charm slides off Hound's face, supplanted by sheer determination and a resolute set of his chiseled jaw as he strides into the ring. I duck under the ropes to follow him. Hound firms his stance, feet planted shoulder-width apart, hands at his sides. His fingers twitch, waiting. I survey him, waiting as well, but he doesn't move. 
Am I expected to strike first? In seconds, I close the divide between us, but before I can pass halfway, extraordinary pressure captures my entire body and my muscles seize. Blood pumps thunderously in my skull, causing everything to blur. I blink to clear my vision, only to learn I'm lying on my back. Hound stands over me, offering a hand to help me up, but this isn't over. I sweep a leg out to knock his feet from under him, and even as his back strikes the mat, I'm landing on top of him. Before I can pin him down, his power presses against me. My back arches and my arms spread wide at my sides. He effortlessly uses a hand to shove me off him. No place for mistakes, Steel, Nevermore says nearby. His voice is dampened as if speaking through water. Let's make this lesson clear. Hound frowns as he climbs to his feet. My vision narrows around him as he raises a shuddering hand, the muscles in his arms twitching. He lifts my body helplessly off the ground. My feet dangle just inches from the mat, and the magnitude of the pressure within me makes it seem as if my body is being stretched out. Fight back, Steel! Nevermore barks. But I can't fight back. Control of my body is no longer my own, no matter how hard I struggle to concentrate. The muscles in my legs and arms strain at the uniform, causing the cloth to tighten like a vice around me. It only intensifies the sensation from Hound's power like fire burning in my blood or some invisible magnet repelling my cells from one another. Fight back! Nevermore snaps. He thrusts a palm out toward me from outside the ring. Suddenly, my skin feels like I've been plunged into an ice bath. The air punches out of my lungs. The training facility disappears, replaced by a desolate landscape. What is happening? We aren't on a simulation platform, yet I'm no longer where I should be. In the distance, a ghostly form with indistinct features shrieks as lightning rains down on him. My chest aches. I struggle to move, but my body resists. There is no rational reason for the dread in my chest. More than anything else, I need to reach him, help him, save him. It's a compulsion driving me onward. My feet shuffle slowly forward as if I'm struggling against the weight of a wrecking ball. My target howls in torment so savagely that it rips at my soul. I roar, tugging harder at the invisible force holding me back. Why do I care what happens to him so much? By the time I reach him, my body aches like never before. Every part of me threatens to collapse. Stretching a trembling hand toward his charred flesh, I whirl him around only to be confronted by his back again. I turn him around repeatedly, but he possesses no front, no face. I howl in defeat and crumple to the ground. The training facility returns in a flash, and I am on my knees in front of Hound weeping. The humiliation of it overpowers me. Great. My first day, and I'm openly weeping in front of my team. As if to punctuate my humiliation further, Nevermore sneers. I bury my face in my hands to cover the sobs. Pathetic, Nevermore scoffs. In the field, the radicals will employ every advantage they have against us. And you are remarkably weak. You have a long way to go, Steel. What did you do to her? Hound asks, the curiosity in his tone as clear as a bell. He isn't perturbed or furious. He's intrigued. Take her back to her apartment, Nevermore orders. Hopefully tomorrow she won't be as worthless. He squats beside me and leans close, whispering in my ear. If you depend on your fists in the field, you won't last long. What a shame that would be. I suck in breaths, battling for command of my emotions. What just happened? Who was that strange figure? Why did he matter so much to me that I would fight so hard to reach him? Hound places an encouraging hand on my shoulder. Come on, let's get you back home. Home. Is that what they call this place? Sniffling and briskly wiping away tears, I attempt standing with Hound's support, and his arm offers me some comfort. 
Despite my super strength, my entire body feels as if it has been crushed under a mountain. I can't recall the last time I felt so powerless. The burden was not physical, but emotional. If Nevermore aimed to get into my head and pick me apart, he succeeded. Back in my apartment, Hound turns on the light and ushers me to the sofa. I sink into it with a thud that causes the sofa frame to object. Hound retreats to the kitchen, emerging a minute later with a carton of milk, a protein bar, and an apple. Food helps, he asserts. These enhanced powers can draw a load out of us. Our bodies burn calories faster so we have to make sure we are eating whenever we have a chance. I devour the protein bar, scarcely noticing the hints of peanut butter and cranberries, then guzzle the milk to wash it down. Hound sinks onto the sofa and leans an arm on the back as he observes me eat with amusement. What about you? I ask, mopping my arm across my mouth. Oh, it hits me for sure. It'll be worse for you, though. I manipulate other bodies. You manipulate your own, which means you will burn calories even faster. I pluck up the apple, and that same sense of sadness washes over me as earlier that morning. I can't explain it, and I frown at the fruit as I brush a thumb over the red skin. Hound cocks his head curiously. You okay? Nevermore doesn't like me much. He snorts. Nevermore doesn't like anyone, maybe because he knows what we think of him. That gets my attention, and I meet Hound's gaze invited in by that charming smirk on his face and the way his blue eyes dance in delight. You don't like him? I ask. Hound sighs in a manner that implies something more dramatic than out of a desire to communicate any genuine emotion. We are a unit. I don't have to like him. I only have to trust that when we're out there, he has my back. That's what counts. I spin the apple in my hands. Images of that charred boy from training arises. I blink back unexpected tears. The boy had no front, no face. He was a little more than a charred body in gray scrubs. Yet, a sense of familiarity teases at my mind, filling me with longing, fear, and despair. It makes no sense. Hound's hand slips over mine. The touch sends a shiver down my spine. I react before thinking, jerking away and shoving him back hard enough to send him to the other end of the sofa. The wounded expression on his face immediately makes me regret my actions. I'm sorry, I mumble. He rubs at his chest where my palm struck him, wincing marginally. You really don't remember me at all? I want to remember everything, but the harder I try, the deeper the surrounding vacuum becomes. I shake my head. His shoulders sag and he examines me as if he's seeking to decide whether I'm sincere. At last, he reaches his hands out to me, palms up, and waits. What will happen if I take them? Curious, I set down the apple, edge closer, and slip my hands into his. They are warm and soft. Hound releases a breath of relief and his thumb brushes over my hand. I expect he means the gesture to be endearing, or maybe to shake something loose in my memory. But all I desire is to pull away. It requires sheer willpower to wait patiently. A sensation of tingling brushes my hands, then slowly travels up my arms as warmth flows through my entire body. He is using his power on me. I want to recoil. I want to lean against him. His gaze remains locked on me, dragging me in deeper. My heart quickens. I can tell you how we know each other, he says, and the dulcet rhythm of his voice matches my breathing. All I can offer is a nod. The edge of his lips curls up in a slight, handsome grin. We've known each other for six years, but not as hound and steel. We met in sixth year at homeroom, and you loathed me. He chuckles, as if that should be amusing when I find it anything but. But my ninth year, we were practically inseparable. Bianca and Jimmy, the couple everyone else wanted to be. Couple? We dated? Tenderness relaxes his features, causing him to appear even more handsome than ever before. 
My breath catches, and suddenly I can believe that we were a couple. I can no longer tell if that tingling in my skin is from his power or from within myself. In tenth year, we visited my parents' cabin on the lake together to celebrate your birthday. Hound, Jimmy, leans closer, and I'm drawn toward him. An intoxicating sensation makes my head swim. And that night? His fingers drift along my neck. I was not even aware that he had released my hand. I swallow a lump in my throat, realizing he's about to kiss me. I jerk away and jump to my feet. The suddenness of it alarms him. I think you should go now, I say. Bianca, I'm sorry, I just... He rubs his neck. I really miss you. I'm so happy to have you here. All the yearning and headiness I experienced before, all the attraction, collapses. Was it even real or just a trick of his power? I shake my head, remembering feeling irritable with him before. Maybe what you claim is true, but it doesn't feel right. I think it's best if you leave. He balks. I couldn't care less if my words wounded him. Bianca, good night, hound. He rises and starts toward the door, but hesitates before opening it. Just so you know, I asked for this unit so I could be with you. He opens the door and slides out as Polly enters. She glances back over her shoulder to watch him leave. So, are you two a thing? Because if not, I wouldn't mind making a go at that myself. I scoff and stalk to my room. Be my guest, I snap, then slam the door hard enough to crack the frame. The nerve of him, presuming we could just pick up whatever we might have had before. Just considering being with him sends a renewed surge of irritation through me. Yet, I cannot justify why. 5. A nightmare wakes me, but even as I wake, the nightmare fades. I can't recall any of it distinctly. An overwhelming pang of hunger seizes my stomach. I shuffle out to the modest kitchen to dig out something to eat, rubbing my eyes. A faint light glowing from Polly's door catches my attention. What time is it? Why is she still awake? After an exhale, I chew the pre-cooked steak without bothering to slice it. I sink my teeth into the juicy flesh, tearing it off with an almost feral starvation. The dose appeared on my nightstand before bed, and I injected it without a second thought. The blue liquid flowed through me when I depressed the plunger. Nevermore said the dose would assist my sleep. It produced no such results. Instead, I'm groggy and disoriented. The nightmare is gone altogether now, yet I feel the surge of adrenaline from powerful fear and a profound sense of loss, as if something valuable had been ripped away from me. Eager to purge the nightmare for good, I pad barefoot toward Polly's door. Maybe she can keep me company or help interpret some of this. Hushed voices emanate from within her room. I press my back to the wall beside the door, unclear why I'm nervous about being caught eavesdropping. Who would visit at this time anyhow? Unless Polly has a boy in her room. Deep denial, Polly says. Her companion snorts. Well, let's keep it that way, he says. And I recognize Nevermore's tone instantly. Our orders were clear, and you know what can happen if we fail him. No, I'm not meant to hear this discussion. If there is a threat or risk, if they fail whatever this order is, I don't want to be caught listening. I creep back toward my room, careful not to bump anything or produce a noise. The steak in my hand makes my mouth water, but I don't dare take a bite and risk them hearing the squish of the meat. I close my door, allowing a crack open so I can hear or see when Nevermore leaves. As I linger, I inhale the rest of the steak, then lick the savory meat and juice off my fingers. By the time I'm finished, Nevermore emerges from Polly's room. She trails alongside him. 
He appears more casual than he acted earlier in the day. The way he steps and carries himself reveals a cool, confident nature that contrasts with the rigidity and unforgiving edge he had around me. They arrive at the door, and he places a hand on her shoulder, then slides out. Polly closes it behind him and peers over her shoulder toward my room. I gasp and shuffle away from the door. Can she sense me watching? Does she know I overheard them? Deciding to lean into the moment as Polly retrieves a drink, I open my door and stretch, pretending to have just woken. She spins around and squeals. Maybe she didn't detect me after all. You scared me, Steele, she says, pressing a hand against her chest and squeezing her cup of water on the countertop. Sorry, I didn't intend to. Why are you awake? Nightmares. And hunger. Not a lie in the slightest. Polly studies me for a moment. She nods. I can understand that. Have you, um, been up for long? No. Also not a lie. I thought I overheard another voice in here, though. Was someone else here? No. Polly doesn't even blink as she lies to my face. Can I ask you something else? I ask, snatching a carton of milk from the fridge. Um, sure. She leans back against the counter, crossing her arms over her rather large chest and cupping her glass of water in one hand. Earlier, when I mentioned my name, you seemed... afraid of me. Why? Polly chews her lip and gazes into the glass of water as if it possesses her answer there floating on the surface. You just... have a reputation. I blink. What does that mean? As if understanding my surprise, Polly sighs. First, when you went through phase one, you became a little... wild. As the enhancement worked its course. I overheard you took out ten guards on your own with only your hands and feet. Ten guards? Why do I not remember that? Polly takes a leisurely sip, then proceeds, unable to match my gaze. And your brother, well, he sort of intimidates us. All of us. My brother? Coppery eyes like mine a comforting arm over my shoulders. Dr. Forrest Pond? I ask, recalling the name from my tablet and how it filled me with the same familiar emotion, not to mention that we share the same last name. That couldn't be a coincidence. Polly meets my gaze with a timid one of her own. No, not timid. Scared. She is frightened of Forrest. Why? You don't remember him? She says, bewildered. I shake my head. Not exactly. My memory is like water. I can't grasp more than sensations or emotions. Pieces come to me like reflections, but they ripple and dissipate just as swiftly. Have you met him? Polly nods. He looks like me, right? Yes, she says deliberately. He is the sole person I seem to have any portion of memory of. I lean against the counter on my elbows. I want to see him. Polly opens her mouth as if about to reveal something, but must change her mind because she snaps it shut again. Did you lose memories too? I ask, swapping the subject. For whatever reason, Forrest makes her uneasy. I don't need to force the subject now. Some. Not as much as you. I remember my family, but nothing good. She rubs at her neck and for a moment appears to retreat into some awful memory. And I remember enlisting for this program, standing at the desk and pressing my finger to the contract. For a flash, Polly frowns, but quickly throws it off. Anyway, they say that phase one can affect everyone differently. Some people, like Hound, retained all of their memories, while others of us have more scattered pieces. Or none at all. It barely seems fair that I should be the only one to remember practically nothing. Nothing but anger, sadness, 
and an appetite for vengeance. Hound said we used to date, or maybe we still did when I signed up, I say, tugging my hair over my shoulder and absent-mindedly braiding it. All I can remember about him is anger, disgust, and, on some level, attraction. Well, the attraction I can understand, Polly says with a smirk that lights up her face. I think every girl in this place has tried flirting with him at some point, not that any of us stand a chance. From what I gather, he's taken with you. I tug on the braid in annoyance, then finish the last of the milk, smacking the empty carton down on the counter hard enough to force the plastic crumple. Polly raises her eyebrows but gives no comment. Even now, thinking about being with Hound fills me with inexplicable fury. It pulses through me, engaging the enhanced muscles as if readying for a confrontation. The sight of my swelling muscles must alarm her because Polly's eyes become large. A lot of anger, evidently, she says, alluding to my previous remark. You're honestly not interested? I shake my head. It's troublesome to even consider when thinking about being with him causes such a backlash. It will thrill the other girls to hear that, Polly says with a lilting laugh. She steps closer, settling her hand on my shoulder as Nevermore had done with her. I should get some sleep, and so should you. I hear Nevermore can be pretty ruthless in training. That is a grievous understatement. We can talk more tomorrow, Steele, Polly says as she drifts back toward her room. Hound has all of his memories from before, which clarifies why he could reveal so much about our time together. But how much of it is true? If you enjoyed this sample, click the links in the description to hear more. Do you want free audiobooks, ebooks, or autographed paperbacks? Join me on Patreon at patreon.com slash szdavies underscore character assassin. You'll gain access to my Discord server, behind-the-scenes updates, merch, and so much more.